Hello, everybody. Welcome to the State of Mind podcast. My name is Mike Stroh. On today's episode, we are going to be talking about addiction recovery, mental illness, and how difficult and complicated it can be for people in recovery from addiction and all the different ways that people can find support how they find support, where they find it, what are the different different problems that come up, how to heal relationships, how to focus on the personal side. And on the show, we have Lucas Wade, who has quite a story of his own in terms of what he's been through and how he got to where he is today. And we are going to be talking about his startup, Spotlight Recovery. It's a YouTube channel and a resource for people in recovery from addiction. You know, they say the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it is connection. And, you know, particularly in today's COVID world, connecting in ways we were used to is not happening nearly the way we all might want. So the resource that he has created is to help serve that, but more importantly, just serve people who are looking for guidance and advice who might not otherwise be able to get it. Or those who, you know, like to be reminded and want to practice more and be connected to a community of people in recovery. So without further ado, I bring you Lucas Wade. What's up, Lucas? How's it going? (laughs) Hey, good, Mike. How are you doing, man? I'm good. I am good, sir. So I did a little intro but I always think it is best when the guest introduces themselves and, and sort of describes what they have going on. So if you could do that, um, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. And thanks a lot for having me on too. This is great, man. So uh, my name's Lucas. I'm the creator of Spotlight Recovery. Spotlight Recovery is a YouTube channel. It's a platform really I'm trying to develop to support folks struggling with addiction and mental health. Uh, I found that, and we're going to get more into it, but as a lot of people know in the system, there are a lot of gaps. And the whole point of me developing this channel is I want to be able to create accessible and affordable, like it's YouTube, it's going to be free. So accessible support for people struggling with addiction and mental health that otherwise are not going to have access to any of these supports. You know, I, I spent a lot of time doing research and I just couldn't find any adequate support on arguably one of the greatest online platforms that we have, which is YouTube. And I felt that there's no good reason for there to be such a massive gap and no utilization of such a great platform that could help so many people. So with this budding channel and company, I'm hoping to grow it to help fill that gap. Right on. Yeah. We were talking the other day about how, parts of the recovery community have not modernized along with, you know, the technology and all this sort of new forms of communication. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's hard to find to begin with quality uh, support outside Mm -hmm. of a clinical environment. So um, I guess how, how do you see that bridge between, you know, I guess the thought coming through my head is parts of recovery are very private and um, I guess protected people's environments. Mm -hmm. And so bringing it into an online space like this is new, I guess, in some ways, all this new technology broadcasting of everything everywhere. Mm-hmm. I think it's a lovely idea and I have also have not seen much. It's hard to find people who can speak to the problems people are facing kind of eloquently or in a way that is relatable and helpful. Um, and so it's great that you are trying to bring that here. And I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on all that and how you might be trying to help bridge that gap because if it gets bridged um, more people might become more comfortable to get into these sort of 
more online, uh, open source, if you will, uh, ways of helping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple different thoughts, uh, that I have on it and that connect with this channel and my idea and, and why I'm trying to do what I do. Um, the first and well, the main focus a lot with the concept and with the channel is access. You know, um, I've worked in recovery for the past about eight and a half years in the addiction and mental health industry. So as long as I myself have been in recovery, right? This is all coming from that lived experience place. And so with all that work, that was one of the biggest things that I found is just that people are just facing a total lack of access with getting the supports they need. I mean, your two main options, right, for treatment are either going to be public or private, right? And now we're speaking Canadian system. That's where my experience is, right? So Canadian system, either uh, public funded, which are endless, endless wait lists. I've seen wait lists that are 10 years in length. So the day that somebody reaches out and says, I need help and support now, and your response is, okay, we're just going to need you to hang on for 10 years, and we hope it works out and then you can come to us at that point. Or the other option is then private. So go to private treatment center. Everybody say, great, we can have you come in today. No problem. It's just going to cost $40,000. And if you are struggling with addiction, like me, you have spent all your money on your addiction. So you don't have access to those kind of funds to get the help that you need there. And that's not your fault. That is a result of having an untreated disease, but it seems punitive in that sense. So those are your two options are wait endlessly on a wait list or spend money. Well, you don't have the money to spend. So you hope that you have people in your life or are able to get medical financing to cover treatment. And then even if you do, I mean, chances are you're probably already going to have a lot of debt and things you need to pay back and cover as a result of your addiction. Now you're going to add on top of that, the debt of getting the help that you need to literally survive, right? These are the two results. And it, it, to me, it's unbelievable. Like it blows my mind. So the main focus of this channel, and I need to like disclaim in the sense, so people understand this is not meant to be a replacement for full-on therapy, for a treatment program, for individualized uh, counseling with a person. It's not meant to be a replacement to that. It's meant to be the best resource that it can be to help somebody work towards a life in recovery. Any amount of support is better than nothing, right? And especially with addiction, we have so much of this black and white thinking. I'm either going to quit or I'm not. I'm going to get all the help I need, the best help possible, or uh, there's nothing for me and, and wish me luck, right? So I want to make this the most supportive and best platform that it can be. So if somebody literally has not a penny to their name, but they're able to get on Wi-Fi somehow, get onto a screen, right, to view or listen to any of this, to have as much resource there as possible for them, loaded up with recovery coaching videos, so a lot of basic everyday things that you can do to help and start building a life in recovery. Just basic everyday things that in general, I don't feel a lot of people talk about in our industry enough, like how important a healthy daily routine is, how important knowing how to like cook and feed yourself properly and eat or especially on a budget if you have spent all your money on addiction like I did right? Basic, just self-care and healthcare things. I mean, so much of this basic knowledge is either, yeah, waiting forever for the public funding to get that information, or you can get it right now if the price is right. And, and those as two and only results to me are just completely unacceptable. There's no reason so much of this basic information should not be made accessible for people in an easy to find space to start getting some support right there in that moment right? Even a grounding exercise. Why can you not open up a YouTube app and find simple and quick grounding exercises to get you out of a panic mode right in that moment, right? It's just all of these basic things. And I spent a month 
in research and development before I started building this channel just to see if there were resources like this out there and I couldn't find them. I couldn't find them. So they either don't exist or the numbers are still so small and they're so not well known after a month of me putting in research full time, I couldn't find them. So something like it has to be done. And I just, I felt there's no reason why I'm not the guy that can do it or at least start it off. Right. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, one thing as you were talking that I think is massively difficult for, I mean, not everybody because people, you know, addiction doesn't, discriminate so to speak so wealthy people you know end up in this place and they pay their way through um but for a lot of people and i think your experience is an excellent example of that is how you managed your finances and all those kind of things going back to school doing all that stuff working um yeah i mean i think it would be interesting to explain some of that you know like you went into uh i can't remember what the name of them are but like can you explain that process for you like after getting out of treatment and then building up the skills and the habits and etc like you said cooking managing a budget all those kind of things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well i mean it for me, it's just come, I've built and developed these skills over time through being in recovery for the past eight and a half years. You know, over time, these are all basic skills that I just, as a human being, didn't really have, you know? Um, and so I had to learn all these things as I went and lived through and started building a recovery and what a lot of people don't understand if you're not in, in recovery or struggling with any form of addiction or mental health is that you are having to learn all these things which are new, they're scary, they're hard, they are not normally talked about like societally, I don't think, not nearly enough. You are having to learn all, do, all these things, make drastic changes in your life. Who isn't scared of change? or what human being doesn't love their little comfort zone bubble and doesn't want to change that, right? So you are having to do all these things on top of staying sober for a day or on top of like just not relapsing behaviorally or not succumbing, like being overwhelmed by whatever that mental health is that you're dealing with. So the compound of the stress and of what you're trying to accomplish is really massive. And I don't think people quite realize that enough, you know? Um, so yeah. it was an unbelievable amount of work and hard and tough and scary to do. And uh, going through it, like, you know, I was just blessed to have built that recovery circle, those friends and family that I had to help coach me through it. I was blessed to have financial support to go to treatment and then to go to ongoing treatment to be able to learn these things and get that kind of help. If I didn't, I don't see how I could have the recovery that I did today. And that was one of the things that I look back with all of this is if I didn't have that kind of support, where was I gonna learn these things from? Where was I going to learn all this? It wasn't, it just wasn't out there, right? Which is so important of, as to why I'm wanting to incorporate these things and build them on this channel. It's because I was fortunate enough to have had that amount of support to build the kind of life and recovery that I have now. So as we know in recovery, it's now my job to pay that forward and to help the next people in line. And the channel has the ability to do that tenfold, tenfold. If I'm able to share all that experience with what I learned through recovery to help get me to where I am now, to then help others build and do those same skills. I mean, I've had both ends of the spectrum, which is why I feel 
my experience with this is so important because yes, I had support to go through treatment and to get ongoing therapy. And I also have been in and out of homelessness for years and lived in sober Toronto community housing and been on social assistance and lived off like 700 bucks a month. So I have had and done both, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. So being able to share that experience and just being like, okay, if you have 20 bucks for the week to eat, here's what you can do with it. Here's what I did to help me stretch a buck to get like just the basic, what's the most that I can eat with 20 bucks for a week? Like basics, like you can't find info like that anywhere. You know, and I'd had like, I found no real guidance or support through our social system looking for this kind of stuff. And throughout all this, keep in mind, I'm not trying to necessarily like place blame and get mad here because that's not going to help anybody. It's just these are observations and experiences that I had and realized that these are huge areas that need to be filled and covered essentially. Right. And the other part too with it is that. Over time, I want to make this channel really collaborative. So it's not all going to be just coming, hey, here's me. This is my experience. This is what I did. I hope it can help you too. Because a lot of people do that, which is great. But through this time, through my work and education experience, I've also been able to make a lot of contacts. So I want to be having videos with other folks coming on too, right? Like rather than like I'll share my experience with you on cooking on a budget, but why would I not want to bring in some like current industry chefs and professionals to come and do that? I can teach you my experience on fitness and yoga, but why would I do that when I can bring in a yoga instructor? I can bring in a fitness instructor instead and share their experience with you as well. So on top of just my personal experience, build it as this like wealth of information for all these aspects of recovery that somebody needs to really build a strong, sustainable lifestyle and bring in all these different professionals as well to be sharing and making videos with them to put on this channel. So when you come onto it, not only are you going to get all of my lived experience from recovery and all of my recovery coaching and counseling experience that I'm going to share as well, but then when you're curious about these things, fitness, nutrition, yoga, healthy daily routines, th all these things, you're going to be hearing from other people that are practicing this every day, other professionals in these niche areas to really start building the best and the most sustainable recovery that you can for yourself. Does it all this kind of make sense? Yeah, definitely. Uh, I kind of wanted to ask you, uh, along that line of, of thinking and ways of people getting support outside of, you know, 12 step rooms, there's nothing basically. And a lot of people are not mm -hmm. comfortable going to 12 step rooms. I mean, it's not exactly, I have, I can empathize with people that don't, want to go to 12 step groups. So yeah, definitely very much. Yeah. And so, I mean, <laughs> it's not that I necessarily think that that choice is going to be helpful in the long run or not, but they need support somewhere and it's not, you can't, I mean, it's so difficult. I think, you know, for, for some people, we just end up in a place where it works for us, you know, but for the people that it doesn't mm -hmm. work, I mean, it's hard. And so mm -hmm. I well, think and, your, and, what you're providing is, is going to fill some of that gap. Sorry. Yeah. Well, exactly. No, no, no. Because that sum that you're talking about, the sum of us find a space where it works. That mm -hmm. sum is less than 4%. Okay, out of everybody we know who struggles with addiction, less yeah. than 4% have a long-term recovery, right? Long-term, the number used for that was five years. So in total, 
less than 4% of people will make it in sobriety or in recovery from a behavioral addiction for over five years. That number's horrible. <laughs> that is but do awful. You, I got to just ask you about, do you mean staying abstinent? Because that's the whole, there's, that's a whole nother part of the recovery world conversation. Some people are resistant to that idea. Is that what you mean though? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that's fine. Yeah. And, I, and I, and I get that. Yeah. That's what yeah. those numbers are based on is a continuous form of sobriety. Right. Okay. Right. And so I get that. And you can, Oh, endless arguments of, well, what do you <laughs> consider makes a healthy recovery or not? What success or not? Like the concept of success right. rate is right. You right. can't, I don't think you could ever define that. Right. Yeah, totally. But, yeah, yeah. Well, it's personal, I guess. But well, I exactly. Know. Right. So that's up to the individual. So right. personally, I would not want to be coming into recovery to be going in and out for years because that struggle is so painful. Right. I would not want to Archer. be, it, it, that's what I mean. I would not want to be living like that. So many people after they try to enter and come into recovery, when they relapse, the mortality rate is so much higher exponentially. It puts people at higher risk. So I get these thoughts and discussions of um, keep coming back and keep trying and it's okay and keep working through this and you can get it. I'm not saying that is not true. That is very true. What is also true is that the risk and potential of literal death from this increases exponentially when people start going down that road. And, and folks like us, we're already losing Oh, even emotional. Way too many people as it is who are suffering from our disease. Way too many people. There's no reason that these numbers should be so high and that people who suffer from the things that we do should literally not be surviving and not be living to be getting this kind of help. It's unbelievable to me. Like, it's not acceptable to me. It breaks my heart that this yeah. is true. Like, why are we here alive and sober and talking to each other, Mike, and not somebody else. Why? I don't know. I can't answer that. What I do know is I am, we are, you know, thank you, God, the universe, whatever made that happen. Mm -hmm. Just gratitude out to the universe that that is the case. And therefore, what can we do to help other people who are struggling just the way that we did? Right In this year, 2020 alone, in June, by June, so halfway through the year, the mortality rate in Canada from addiction had already doubled. We had reached the total mortality rate for 2019 by June of 2020. Supports and resources like this are needed more than ever right now. This is needed more than ever, these kind of numbers. And that's just trackable numbers, right? You track, oh, how many people do we know died from addiction or addiction-related causes? Those are tracked. Well, how many people die using alone or by themselves, right? And I know this is getting super heavy, everybody. I get it, but this is just, this is our reality. So how many people, like how many are forgotten or unknown or never even got remotely the kind of help that they needed because there was nothing there accessible for them? It is so important that we do stuff like this and that we keep doing what we're doing, right? So then people can start to argue about success and what does success mean and how long of a time. It's like, I'm literally trying to work with life or death here with people, right? And you have to be alive to consider or then even argue at what is going to be success for you. And I think that's the more important part. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so do you mean when you say sort of the relapse rate increases people's risk of death and all kinds of other health problems, is that, does that include people that take, you know, a harm reduction strategy or, you know, I did all these substances. I'm not going to do those anymore. I'll just do this one. Um, something like that. Or is it more broad in terms of just. 
trying to control the uncontrollable, something like that. I mean, there's, I'll add one more to that is, you know, when you get into the mental health system, so to speak, from a clinical perspective, mm -hmm. you know, they're so resistant to passing judgment. I don't know if that's the right word, but just saying, you know, abstinence probably is the best thing. And if you can manage that, that's probably the best. You know, they'll just say, oh, not everybody wants to be abstinent and it's okay to do harm reduction and da 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 da. Mm -hmm. um, which I find not accurate, well, uh, not ideal. Mm -hmm. um, and before, I, before we go on, I think it's important to clarify. Um, harm reduction. Harm reduction doesn't really mean, oh, you're doing heroin, you should do cannabis. Harm reduction is really reducing the things that cause people to die or to transmit disease. That's why clean injection sites are there and et cetera, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. ultimately the impact of all that behavior just costs our healthcare system way more money. Yeah. So yeah. that's part of it too. Yeah. That's the foundation exactly is to keep... Yeah us folks who are suffering from this off of the healthcare system. So it's not an added expense on our healthcare system. That's the response. Yeah. Oh, Oh man. I, oh, I'm like stopping myself from getting mad <laughs> at how mad that truth makes me. Cause it is true. It is. And the focus of this channel, I don't want to dig into that too much of the the endless argument of harm reduction versus abstinence because that's right. never gonna that's never gonna stop. I don't know if that argument's ever gonna go away. <laughs> and my that's not my purpose here, and that's not my purpose with my work or my experience. Statistically, from what I've been speaking from, does come from an abstinence approach and model because that is what I need. I cannot use safely, and from what I was trained in and have worked in for over eight years. So that's where that comes from. Mm -hmm. Another uh, beauty that I love about building this channel is that I'm just taking that argument off the table. It doesn't matter if you're coming here looking for harm reduction or abstinence. I'm not going to tell you to do either. It's your choice. It's your life. It's your recovery. I just want to put as much resource there available for people to use as much as they want, just to have it as an option, just to be there, to try these things, right? Just the more that is accessible and available for people, how can that not help more? How can that not make an impactful difference? Mm -hmm. I can't tell anybody to do anything. And especially, I mean, hello, being an addict, oh, we are so stubborn and self-righteous by nature. Like you tell me to go left. I'm going to go right twice on purpose just to spite you. And then I'm going to blame you and say, if you didn't tell me to go left in the first place, I never would have gone right. So really, this is your fault. <laughs> <laughs> that is how, when I am stuck in the sickness and throes of my disease, that is how I think. So if I have the audacity to then meet somebody else who has an addiction and say, hey, you need to do this. You have to do this. I already know how that's going to go because I know what I would say. <laughs> who am I? That's not my, that's just, it's not conducive. It's not my choice. It's not my place, right? If I needed so much help to not only get sober, sober, but to stay that way and to build this kind of a life and recovery, who am I to tell somebody else what they need? To, I've had people telling me, recommending ways to live my life my entire life. I have no place to then turn around and say, therefore, now I know, and you have to do this. Not at all, man. I can't take that kind of approach. It's just entirely, mm -hmm. I'm sharing as much of my experience as possible with as many people that I've met along the way who have helped me build a life in recovery. So it is all in one accessible easy to find location so other people can get as much help that I have had 
that we can share through this platform just to be there. Does this kind of make sense? You see what I'm saying? You know, yeah, it, definitely, does that, yeah. that's another big part that is so important for me is just to have that because the other thing too, and it kind of connects with what we were talking about on privacy with treatment, which for me relates with anonymity, right? Disclosure, all of these things. Well, same, you're watching stuff on YouTube, right? You do it through like incognito windows or something. So you're not going to have like views tracked or something. So you can keep your view private. It's watching a video. You don't have to share this with anybody. Clear browser history. If it's something that's like shared, if it's a personal device, I mean, you know, I make that as private as possible and it's just same thing. It's just there for people to access and use if they need and want it. So they don't have to be sharing this with anybody when they get started. Making that first call, like, oh my God, do you remember how heavy the phone was the first time you had to call somebody and reach out for help with your mental health? Oh my God. Just thinking about it now, I remember the anxiety. Oh man, so overwhelming. So I'm not here to put that pressure on anybody. It is there if you want it. So much recovery as well with addiction and mental health. So much autonomy is lost. Uh, things get really pushed on people, forced, you know, court ordered to go or mandated or family intervention or job or what have you. And they can help. But I mean, I think any human being would like the autonomy and the choice and ability to reach out for help or to start looking in this and asking about it when they're ready, right? If they have that option to go that path. I didn't. I was blessed to survive suicide and therefore got help. And so everybody was like, okay, well, do you want help? And I just, yes, yes, across the board to get the help. So I was blessed to literally survive a apparently medically unsurvivable situation to then get here to go through that. So for folks that aren't going through that kind of an extreme, you have the ability to look at this or not. I'm not going to make you watch a damn thing. <laughs> it is there if you want it. And that's the point is to make it there. And, and you can watch it engage as much as you want. And you don't have to tell anybody when you're not ready. You can share it with people when you are then share it with other people in your recovery community as you build it to hopefully help and support you and everybody else on your journey. You have the choice and the ability to look at all of this stuff. I'm going to do my best and not say I won't because hello human, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to mess up at some point, but I'm going to do my best to not tell anybody what they should or should not do through this platform as opposed to here's what worked for me. This is what saved my life. Give it a try and see if it could work for you. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There's something odd about the, uh, the, I guess the bridge that people cross when they decide to ask for help. Um, I would, probably say I didn't even think about asking for help until I thought about it. And then mm -hmm. once I thought about it, mm -hmm. um, similar to you in the sense of give me more, give me more, give me more. It's like once you can experience how freeing it is to ask for help and to get it and to have the help work, um, yeah, that's remarkable. And I think that's another tricky thing with a lot of this is people's lack of experience for asking for help, but also their conditioning to think they should be able to do it on their own, all these kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole nother world or a whole nother way of seeing yourself and the world around you that gets opened up when you start letting go perhaps, and then asking for help. 
And there's no magic answer to that either. You know, people often ask, Mm -hmm. you know, what, what did you do to get help or what, what could you tell people that will ask, you know, help them reach out for help. And it's, there's no, there's no magic answer. You know, it's such a, no, no. And it's like endless. Yeah. You're like, you're like, how many things can I say and think of to answer that question? Because really these are all ideas and pitches, but recovery has to be individualized (laughs) and every person's mental health and experience looks different. So it has to be harbored for that person to get the best help for themselves. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Let's say, you know, like, like roughly that's the projected number is 20 is, is 10 percent of global population suffers from some form of addiction so i can't have the audacity to say one thing that's going to help 700 million people (laughs) reach out for help (laughs) it's not it's not going to happen that would be great if somebody could i don't know if i'd want the pressure but (laughs) you know it's just you can't there's no blanket statement like that and there's no blanket solution which is back to this idea of rather than trying to build a specific program and a regiment and a week by week here's what you do it's just here is as much resource over time because this is going to be built over years to come god willing as many resources as i can put together on this channel right and the more your life and quality of life depends on it, then I hope you're able to dedicate more time to watching these videos and then doing the exercises incorporated with them or then connecting with industry professionals that are going to be on there as well to start building and finding that path for yourself. I need a drink of water. Give me one sec. Yeah. (laughs) Do it. No, I mean, I'll jump in there. The, there are things I think that are non-negotiable. One is you can't do it alone Mm. for sure. And two, I would say is this come, uh, you know, the, the saying is you can't think your way into right action. You have to act your way into right thinking. But what that mm-hmm. really means psychologically is when you're sick and fucked up, you know, in the grips of insanity from addiction or whatever it is, your mind cannot think your way out of a problem. <laughs> most definitely in most situations, but particularly then because you are sick and your thoughts are messed up. And I think that's where kind of this idea of, there's definitely not one right way for sure, but in some sense, if you're not well, then whatever idea and brilliant plan you have to (laughs) change the world around you and your life, it's likely not gonna work out very well. And then, and yeah, you can't do it alone. So. I would say those are the two main things that I think are non-negotiable in some sense, but there's probably others, but I mean, it gets Mm. complicated and, and et cetera. Well, I mean, it's endless, right? It's endless. And I think for me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say that you can't do it alone uh, or like doing it alone is non-negotiable. I mean, for me, I think, the two things, the first thing that I would always ask somebody like, oh, I can do this by myself. I'm going to do it alone. My first question always is, okay, how's that working for you? How's that been going? What has your life been looking like before? And now that you're trying to enter and build recovery by yourself, how is it working? And don't say it for me. You don't have to, to hell with me. You don't have to press or answer anything to me to ask that for yourself. Genuinely right? Mm -hmm. To see if that really is the case or not, because everybody is going to have some form of pride or ego to deal with. That's arguably one of like the number one killer of of an addict is our own ego. (laughs) So everybody's going to have that to deal with. But the, the second part of it is why would you want to deal with it alone? Like, why would you make 
why would you make that choice and make it so much harder for yourself? I mean, I don't know about you, but God, for me, in those last few years of my use, when things were really digging down towards that bottom, I felt so alone and lonely and by myself for years. And however much I wouldn't admit it or would never say it out loud, that is so much of what I wanted is just genuine human connection, camaraderie, camar- you know the word I was trying to say. I'm just, my head's stuck on it. That's really funny. Camaraderie. Um, there yeah, you go. Awesome. There. Woo. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Addiction pro, <laughs> not English major. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> but that real friendship and connections or building your own family. Because so many of us come from broken homes, little to no family support. People that suffer from addiction. So make your own. Why would you not want that? It's there for you. And so many of us, I feel, just don't believe that that's an option for us. We come with from such a place of those feelings of worthlessness. My disease tells me every day that I am unworthy of love and stupid and don't deserve to live and who's going to like me anyway and blah, blah, blah. So why would you not want to prove that little bastard wrong? <laughs> every day, every day, and build a loving community around yourself why would you not want that and take it from me take right take it you know sorry just to finish that thought take it from me take it from us that that is possible for you i can promise you whoever is listening to this we may have never met and it doesn't matter because i can promise you that that is an option for you too the same that it was for me the same way that it was for mike and everybody else that we know would have met through our recovery this is absolutely an option. Don't let that disease or disorders tell you that it isn't because this can be true for you too. And I love that saying of we will love you until you learn to love yourself, finding that support yeah. and compassion from others and learning how to believe that for yourself. Keep coming back, man. Keep doing this work, listening to podcasts like this. I really hope you're willing to check out both of our YouTube channels to find some stuff on there that can help you and keep connecting with others to build this for yourself because it can be there. It is there waiting for you. And I can tell you personally from having both sides, I have had no one in my life via pushing them all out through use or being so intoxicated whenever I was around people I guaranteed was not there to now being so blessed with a life full of friends and family, I don't have enough time to talk to everybody that I want to because of the connections that I've built from this. Anyway, I wanted to finish that thought. That's the end of that. You were going to say something. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. I was, I mean, there are two things. One, it actually is not, I, I mean, I, I am super stubborn on this thing. Like We are animals. We've evolved. We can't do it alone like you will die and be miserable and et cetera. If you try to go through all this alone, biologically, we're not, we have not evolved to be able to do things alone. And so I love the question of how is that working for you kind of thing. Um, Because you almost, well, from one side of it, when you, when you, if you're listening to somebody try to explain it to you, from being on the other side, you kind of can sit and listen, hopefully with some empathy and just mm-hmm. notice the no, the madness, just the excuses and the justifying and the rationalizing. Da, 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 da. Well, if I just do this and just do that, da, 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 da. Um, there's actually, I mean, part of what we know of the brain too, in terms of how it works. And this is something that's so beautiful about, I'd say the recovery rooms, quote unquote, is that that part of your brain, and you might call it the thinking mind or the prefrontal cortex that has evolved Mm -hmm. to do all these incredible things in the world, Mm -hmm. that mechanism in your brain needs to be, or, or we, if we can learn to observe it and distance ourselves from it or just create a little separation from it, then we can start to see how unhelpful it is when we try to use it to solve our problems you know in the 
in the rooms they would you know the word unmanageability but outside of that that part of our brain needs to be understood i guess and seen from a different perspective which is that you know something that mindfulness is really helpful for or just kind of learning about these things um and then there was another thing that you just said that has disappeared from my mind oh no uh what's that i was just saying oh no because oh yeah it's gone if i can help you out with it oh yeah (laughs) it's gone it'll it'll it may reappear it will it will it was yeah so it was like being stubborn about the alone thing understanding how the thinking mind works Mm -hmm. well your other point that you had raised earlier was the quote of you cannot think your way into right action you have to act your way into right thinking right yeah yeah so so kind of so i have two thoughts here the one is back with your first point on the ability to do it alone or not. And even if I, because personally for me, I, I, I would agree. I don't, I don't, I haven't seen somebody who has been able to do this amount of work that we need to do all by themselves. Where I'm coming from with it is I am not going to tell an addict, you can't do something. <laughs> Because for me, you say, I can't do it. What does that mean? Challenge. Resentment. Fuck you. I'm doing this the way I want. I'll show you what I can't do. And I'm going to light my life on fire just to try to prove you wrong. Because I'm not going to let this go. <laughs> I love the thing you said before. And then I'm going to blame it on you, which is the Oh, best. yeah. 100%. Oh, that well, that well, because that's that's the key. That's the last piece. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Manipulation tactic. Amazing. Totally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that now you're feeling guilt. So therefore, actually, step into my web. I'm like, how do I use this now? Right? Oh, my God. Addiction is such a sick disease. Yeah. Oh, it is. Man, it is. the it's, stuff it would it make is. me do when I am fully living in my disease. Oh, my God. That's the way it thinks. So yeah. if you're not going to tell me that is insane, I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> People be like, oh, can you believe this guy? Uh, Listen to these horrible things he said right, on his podcast, right, right, what he would right. do. It's like, no, that is a sick person with no solution and no help. <laughs> that's, that's what I'll do. That's what my disease is going to do, left to its own devices unchecked, right? Yeah. So yeah, that's why yeah. I'm saying specifically, not in disagreement with you, is from a therapeutic approach for me. I am, I've, I've learned to not tell another addict you can't do something because I know what I would do. So I'm not going to push that button in you. <laughs> so that, that's the one, which I think is very important to mention. And then the other is I love that quote that you'd brought up because it is so true. I feel you cannot think your way into right action you have to act your way into right thinking. And it's so funny because, of course, that my ego now kicks in and I'm like, what are all the big fancy neuroscience terms that I can use to make myself sound all smart and important and make people go, whoa, I can't remember them, so I'm not going to try to do that. (laughs) It's just knowing that as because we're creatures of habit, we are habitual, we get into these grooves and the way of doing things really easily and quickly. And then we love them and we just keep repeating it. So having an addiction so much is that, right? I feel anything response to feeling use to deal with the feeling, right? Happy, drink, sad, smoke, (laughs) part, like it doesn't, well, I feel anything. I'm an incredibly emotional person. I believe that everybody that struggles with that addiction is also an immensely sensitive human being like I am. We feel like we don't like, I don't feel emotions. I feel emotions, right? So I feel anything used to shut it down, deal with it. Cause I have no coping tool. I now develop that pattern into an addiction because it's become from once a week to twice a week, to four times, to every day, to a hundred times a day, whatever, right? That is now the pattern 
the habit that I've created. So therefore, I cannot think my way out of that action. That is the habit. That is the behavior I have created in my brain. That is the neural pathway I have developed over years. I therefore have to, and this is where I'm going to have somebody who is an expert in neuroscience <laughs> come and use all the big fancy words because they'll do a way better job than me. I have to create new neuro pathways by taking new action, right? So it's kind of like, imagine you get like a piece of paper and on your piece of paper, you draw a line and then you redraw over that line however many times you used or acted out in your addiction. That is going to be the darkest, thickest line, or you're going to tear the paper up as opposed to, okay, I'm going to enter recovery now. I'm going to try a new behavior. So now on the same piece of paper, draw another line once and compare your two lines, right? Uh, yeah, that's going to be way lighter and, and faded and not nearly as strong and pronounced as the line of the behavior that I've done thousands of times. It is going to take repetition, doing it over and over again, building these new patterns and behaviors to work towards equaling out the depth and the intensity of those lines so that now as I build time and recovery, this is where people start talking about the freedom of choice. This is where I start to now develop choice in addiction or not. Because before, at the end of my days, I had no choice in use. I would wake up, show up to life, instant response to everything in life was drowned out with drugs. Now, as I start replacing use with new coping tools, call a friend, call a family member, go to a meeting, go see a therapist, go to the gym, do a yoga class, cook something healthy, et cetera. As I start doing these things and then doing them repeatedly over time, then is where we start developing this power of choice. So then life happens, feeling comes up. <gasps> and then instead of gut reaction being, I need to go smoke my face off. I could say, well, I could do that or literally anything because the or was never there. <laughs> that or was missing in my life for years. So we're helping build people that or to then continue the sentence. Mm -hmm. I could use or. I could do any of those million things that I'd listed above. Right? And as we develop, we continue these actions. We continue that behavior. That's what then that is how we then act our way into right thinking. By repeating these behaviors, we now learn and are able to make this a conscious decision. Like you're saying, prefrontal cortex, that is where I can now decide if I want to do the healthy or the unhealthy thing. I am given the power of choice by repeated healthy action to build this new narrative for myself. Right. Yeah, that's a good way. Uh, that's mm -hmm. a good way to describe it for sure. Um, I heard a, a recent neuroscientist. He was brilliant um, on the Rich Roll podcast. His name is uh, Andrew Huberman, but he was saying, you know, he says uh, one way he likes to think of addiction is that it's a it's the continuous narrowing of the things that we do that bring us pleasure. So mm. if you think about how the addictions build, right? It's, oh, I like to play sports. I like to hang out with friends. I like to watch movies. And the more and more drugs you do, nothing brings you pleasure except the substance mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's It was a, I it never sort of heard it put that way, but it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And he very much, uh, he also went on to sort of describe a little more how the neurochemicals blah 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 work but he was such a he's like a dude you know he's a dude <laughs> but he was yeah it was really cool but um hearing him describe it that way it was really interesting um mm -hmm. yeah and, and, and i've got yeah. oh sorry just can i 
build with that. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was, I was done. Yeah. <laughs> the one, well, for sure. So the one with it, well, no, it's true. And it's, this stuff gets me fired up because there's one thing. So what's neat is I actually just released a video a week or two ago that takes people through an exercise relating exactly to this. It's called the top five exercise. If, if anybody, if you haven't checked it out, please go check it out. I'll walk you through this exercise that talks about that exactly. It breaks down what are things based on, like as a result of your addiction, or it applies mm -hmm. to mental health too, right? When I was just getting run over, when my depression was at its lowest time, I may know or have thought of things that I would have liked to have done, but there was no way I was getting out of bed for days. So there was no way I was actually going to do them. And then once that happens long enough, then eventually you start to forget, well, what are the things I like to do? Is that going to make you happy? I don't know. My depression was so drowning, that would be the response. And I saying I don't know was a pretty honest answer at that moment in time because my mental health was so overwhelming, right? So this exercise uh, like combats that thinking and goes through this discussion exactly. Let's really explore what are things you used to like to do, you used to do, but then stop doing as a result of addiction, or then things you always have wanted to do, but have never even considered doing because of your mental health. Mm, mm. So I break it all down. It's a great exercise. Uh, it's really fun. Um, it, it sounds like all daunting and scary, but what I love about it is you are digging into the really the things like big motivators and things that you really want to get out of life in recovery. And this connects earlier with harm reduction in the sense of why for me it wouldn't work or I wouldn't want to try it is because the past, the last couple of years of my life in use, I hated, I hated every aspect of my life. So why would I want to attempt to cut out partial drug use and then keep <laughs> living my life that I hate that I'm using drugs to cope with? Like what? Why would I want to do that to myself? That's okay. not why I'm coming into recovery, right? Mm -hmm. So, so much for where abstinence and that piece comes in with this is like, now that I've known more about recovery, I, I changed this thought in about half a second where I first came into recovery and said, all right, I'm going to learn how to slow down, moderate, and then that's it. Very quickly, that changed to screw all that. I am going to build the best life imaginable for myself because my drug use and my mental health have been costing me a life. So to hell with that, I'm going to live a life that I want. This is empowering for yourself, not just to quit being a slave to addiction and mental health, but then the opposite of building a trajectory to then build a life that I want out of this. I'm just not going to get healthy. I'm going to live the best damn life that I can. <laughs> Right. That's beautiful. Yeah. I, I love that part of this. Um, I wrote, I wrote it down this time, so I didn't forget. Uh, uh, <laughs> one is as you were describing the, you know, what are the things that I used to like that I don't do anymore? What do I want to do, et cetera. Um, I think it's helpful to point out part of the, addictive mind perhaps or even the mm. pathology or the complex you know whatever word works for you part of the illness or the insanity is lying to yourself that you are going to do all these things or you're, you're at that point where you feel so horrible about yourself um, that the only way out because the drugs are making it go away is to lie to yourself, right? Or to pretend that, Oh, tomorrow it'll be different. Or once this happens, it'll be different or, you know, whatever the cacophony of fucking bullshit that comes out of your head, you know, it's like, uh -huh. it's never ends. Oh my God. But that's such a huge thing for people that at least for yep. me, it was huge. And I, you know, being as a therapist, when I hear people describe kind of these things, it's sort of, it's just a, a reminder. Um, so that part yeah. is working a lot and that keeps us sick and in denial. And the other thing that I love 
that you brought up is the, we don't just remove the drug from our life or the, I mean, we get a life. That's such a powerful and important thing that Mm. agreed in some sense, I get, you know, I said to somebody the other day, um, drugs aren't the problem, they're the solution, you know, that saying. It's a beautiful mm-hmm. one. And sometimes when it hits people, they kind of almost stop in their tracks. And the, mm, it did for me. Go, First time I what? heard it. Yeah. Yeah, oh, me too. Oh, man, flip my world upside down. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. And as you were describing, when we build new habits, and that's, I love that part of the, and I struggle with this too, because it's, do you want to just remove the bad behavior or do you want to become a person that you are proud of and enjoy and all these other things create a life mm-hmm. that's encouraging and comforting and that you can be proud of. That's what we get out of this. Mm-hmm. And that's the beautiful thing that I think is often left out a lot of these discussions. So I'm really glad you glad that you brought that up because that is that's what it's all about mm. baby <laughs> mm. i know right like do you feel that oh, oh i feel oh yeah, i got chills yeah, i'm having yeah, to catch yeah, my yeah. breath yeah oh, yeah Me it is too. it's yeah. so true it's so true man it's just that uh yeah that concept of a promise or like in 12-step yeah. fellowships that those writings the promises like oh my god and if it wasn't true, people wouldn't keep coming back and doing it and proving <laughs> it all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Like, think about it. We're addicts, man. Mm. I know for however long, for me, it was drugs. So I knew that was a promise that if I took a drug, it was going to shut the noise off. That worked. So I kept doing it. Therefore, recovery. If it isn't a promise that you're going to get a life out of this stuff, right? quit being a slave to that drug and living a way that you have no control of, you would not keep coming back to do it. That is a promise. I'm getting that result. I am going to keep doing this because it's happening. (laughs) Right. None of this is bullshit. Right. And that's why I just, I love this work that we get to do with both of our companies. It's just, it's such, Oh, it's such a blessing. It's so amazing because these are things that like, I'm going to speak, well, I'd speak for myself, but I know you pretty well. (laughs) These are things where it's like, where we could say, never thought we're going to be possible for folks like us. Never thought remotely any of this is going to be achievable. (sighs) It comes true. It becomes real through getting this help and working a recovery program. Man, give me a rooftop because I got to shout this. My rooftop is YouTube. <laughs> no, 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 it is yours too. <laughs> On top of the schools and companies and everything where you go and work. That's where we shout this. That's how we do this stuff is to try to share this message. Just to be able to share this truth with people and give them as many resources that we know and that have helped us to try to help them. I mean, that's why I do this, man. And I know it is for you too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what else... I would do. I think that's part of it as well. Um, what were you just, I, I didn't sleep very good last night. So my memory is, oh. is just not there, but something along the lines of, ah, that's what it was. Um, mm-hmm. I guess part of the, like, if I put on my therapist hat and my person in recovery hat side by side, something that is it's in some of the therapeutic approaches but i think what's so amazing about the 12 steps um is that there's there's a real focus on character and values and sort of living in service of yourself and other human beings that is to me, that is more important than learning to, I don't know, combat your negative thoughts or something along those lines. So that's also what, for me, when you speak about, we get a life out of this and et cetera, 
That is all built on a foundation of being a person with integrity and you know living honestly to the best of our ability and being of service to others. Without that, whatever you build on top is kind of lacks the foundation, I guess it is. Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think that's so important and it gets left out a lot and it's hard to communicate to people too, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very much. Absolutely. And it's so much, so much of that is like a perspective shift in that sense. Cause so many people, I think like, okay, I'm going to come in to recovery and I'm going to learn how to stop using or stop my addictive behavior. And it's going to be a fight and a struggle. And I got to like, Oh, self will and raw and hard work and pull up my bootstraps and all that like old world thinking. And it's like, no, man, <laughs> it's no, no, no. Like that. If, if you go down that path, you're going to lose every time, every time. <laughs> and that is not an insult. That is not a fault of a human being. That's yeah. the nature of the disease. That is yeah. the disease that we have all been fighting for years and been losing every time. And just think of every time where you woke up the next morning and said, God damn it. I was not going to do that. I lost count of how many times I said that. And I think we all did. So we yeah. can't keep going down that path, trying to best and overpower and get into some ego battle with my immortal, incurable mental health disorder that is not going anywhere. <laughs> right? It's the opposite. I'm not going to walk down that street and pick a fight. I need to walk down a different street. I need to build a new path. Stop fighting. Let it all go. Nothing about besting or winning or getting one up on or any of that garbage. Walk down a different street. Yeah. Right. I love that little quick three-liner recovery story, right? An addict walks down a street, falls in a hole. Next day, he walks down the same street, but this time he walks around the hole. He doesn't fall in. But the third day, he just walks down a different street. <laughs> to, and that's what we're doing, man. Build the new street. Find it, whatever it is. Go through a totally different path in a new way of living. You know, uh, Dr. Melamus He's wrote this really neat book. He used to be one of the doctors over at uh, Bellwood Health Services years ago. And he's wrote a book called Five Rules of Recovery. It's a really good book. If, if you haven't checked it out, definitely check it out. But it's really cool. And that's his third rule of the five is he says, you must create a new life where it is easier to not use. Now, I'm going to repeat that because how important it is. You must create a new life where it is easier to not use. That is building the new path. That is finding the new street to go down, right? The difference, because you know, there's always that question, well, what's the difference between an addict and a non-addict, right? Because you know, how do you tell? And there's, that's another endless discussion, right? One that I love that really stands out for me is uh, normies <laughs> or non-addicts will change a behavior to better suit their life. Whereas an addict normally will change their life to better suit a behavior, right? So that's where mm -hmm. when you hear people suffering through addiction, changing jobs or losing them and then moving and then cutting out family and whatever, right? If I have a family who is telling me to stop using or you're done, well, in my mind, cool. Well, we're done because I'm going to keep using, right? The boss, oh, you're fired if you don't shape up. Cool. Well, I quit so I can keep <laughs> using, right? We adjust the life to fit the behavior, which is, which is addiction mm -hmm. versus a non-addict doesn't do this. Apparently, 90% of the population do that naturally, Mike. <laughs> Apparently, I don't know. That's not me. <laughs> I have to work at it constantly. I have to learn how to do this. 
but that's the thing we learn how to do. Change the behavior to fit the life, not the other way around. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, that example is most clear with my friends, you know, throughout oh. high school and university. Yeah. Oh, gee, look at all these people. They decided that copious amounts of drug use and alcohol and et cetera probably wasn't going to be a good thing for the rest of their life. So yeah. they stopped. They or stopped. They reduced their consumption. Yeah, no problem. What the I'll hell is that stop. crap? <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say no problem, but you know, they, they stopped. They didn't did do whatever what we they did. needed to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Blows that. my mind. I know. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> that's a, a good example, no doubt. Right? Um, it was crazy. You know, all those friends, yeah, right? Because yeah. I came into recovery when I was 23. And like 22, 23, that's usually when people are graduating university, right? So old people that I went to high school with, right? They'd be like, Oh yeah, you know, hey, finally connect with Facebook, whatever, out of nowhere, and they'd be like, "Oh, what are ask you? Know, what are you doing? Oh, I just graduated university. I got a BA. I'm starting my career job at this place. How about you? What are you doing? Well, let's see. I'm living in an attic in Regent Park. I'm stealing food. I'm, <laughs> you know, doing things to support my." addictive behavior that I shouldn't be doing, nor are illegal, so I won't say. <laughs> and where like four years ago, we were graduating the same high school program. It's like, what the hell, man? <laughs> addiction, not addiction. Oh my God. It's crazy. I know. I know. I know. Oh it's man. It's crazy, no doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mm -hmm. think another along this line that is a is a nice saying I think I read this in a Tony Robbins book. Um, mm. He's a pretty remarkable human being, um, mm -hmm. leaving him aside. But he says, most peeps, people, and this is a genetic thing too, I think, but in general, most people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10. And like, I think mm. when we get in recovery, at least for me, I think in the beginning, you know, <laughs> that stink and think, and as they say, it doesn't go away, you know, quickly, but it's, oh, look at all these amazing things I'm going to do. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And we kind of get on our high horse or our, it's almost the, the grandiosity or the illusions uh -huh. of grandiosity are still there, but they're kind of a little more directed to positive things, I guess. Um, but it, it's helpful, I think, to remember one day at a time, one foot in front of the other, mm -hmm. it's not going to change overnight and that's okay. Mm. It's actually yeah. better because that's how you learn. Um, that's, a just, it's, I have moments or I've had moments over the years, but Generally speaking, I'm much more at ease with that idea, but I still need to be reminded all the time. Oh, every day. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep, definitely, uh, man. Oh. Well, Mike, thank you yeah. so much for having me on this, man. This has been a yeah, blast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's been it lovely, been, yeah. All right. Just great being able to come and just talk recovery with you, man. That's mm -hmm, the stuff we're both mm -hmm. trying to do and work towards to help make a difference in other people's lives the same way that those differences were made in ours. It's really a yeah. blessing. It's the best part of this. It deal. is. The it best is. part. Yeah. So can you just tell people how to find your accounts and et cetera? Yes, absolutely. So YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, everything is under the name Spotlight Recovery. Easy to find. The YouTube channel is the main platform that I'm going to be developing. So if you're looking for all that recovery coaching and support and videos, and then eventually a podcast and other like different treatment options and everything available as well, that's all going to be there as I build it over time. 
the social media is really to help carry that message to folks so they know that the YouTube channel exists and some other little just kind of fun recovery related stuff in there as well. So please check all of those out. And the most important right now is I've got a GoFundMe going. I have launched the fundraiser to help make this uh, in this dream a reality to really be able to build this channel and dedicate a full-time job because it will take it to build this channel into what I want. So same thing, go fund me spotlight recovery. We're going to have links in uh, the descriptions of these videos. I'm sure for you to be able to find yep. and click, but it'll be running until, you know, third or so week of October and we'll see where we're at, but please any support, anything is greatly appreciated just to help get the message out there. So people know it's there. This resource is going to be built so it can help folks as well. So any support, with that is greatly appreciated. So we can build this to be there, to be able to help the next people in line.